I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of 1 Peter. In the New Testament, chapter 4, if you're using a pew Bible, you can find it on page 1016 or 1016 in the pew Bible. Last week, we finished our series studying through the book of Daniel. And we're not going to immediately start a, a new uh, study through a book this morning. Instead, we're going to take a few weeks here at the beginning of the fall term to talk about some practical topics that the elders think would be helpful for the life of our church. And today, we're actually going to look at, at three passages, and I'm going to begin here in 1 Peter chapter 4. Would you follow along starting in verse 7? Peter writes, which is also the word of the Lord, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. Let's pray and ask his blessing before we uh, dig into our study this morning. Father, we come to you. Uh, we thank you again for um, the truths that we have sung this morning, uh, the grace that you have invited us into, the, the home and rest in a weary land that we, we just sang about that, that is, is our hope in this life. Uh, we want, Father, this morning to find our, our comfort and our joy in you and we want, Father, to hear your word and to be instructed in, in how we can live lives that will lead to flourishing um, and, and lead to blessing and that will be pleasing to you. We pray for your spirit to help us this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. The context of these verses we just read, if you were to look through the book of First Peter, uh, the setting really goes all the way back to chapter 3, verse 18. You can glance back there in your Bibles where Peter says, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the Spirit. He's, he's talking about how Christ give us, gives us not only the, the example for our lives but, but also the hope of our lives. And then down in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, we are to arm ourselves or arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And then what he goes on and talks about then in chapter 4 is, is what it means for us as believers to be turning away from sin, to be willing to do that even if we endure the rejection of the world, even if people around us think we're crazy and they, they malign us, they look down on us because we don't enter into the same kinds of things that they do. But we as Christians are those who are to live not for temporary pleasures, but to live in light of eternity like Christ did, knowing that judgment is coming. And so with that thought, then Peter says in, in the verses we just read a minute ago, the end of all things is at hand. Now that doesn't mean that Peter thought that the world was going to end tomorrow. He, he wrote this 2,000 years ago, and he knew that there was a job for the church to do in the world. But what he's saying is that in terms of the Bible's understanding of history, we are at the end of the ages. We're at the end. 
we don't always think that way. We don't have that same view of the world. We're, we're sometimes a little blissfully ignorant of how much human history has gone before us. We are Johnny come latelys in the history of humanity. And even as Christians, we lose perspective that God's plan for the world is all but complete. God's revelation to the world is finished. God's promises to this world have already been fulfilled in the gospel that is now going to all the world. And so according to the Bible, there is no major epoch of history left except the spread of the gospel and the return of Christ. We, we spent the last few weeks looking at the closing prophecies of the book of Daniel. And, and we need to realize that all of the prophetic history that was outlined in Daniel has now occurred, except for the very last part. That's the perspective that Peter has when he says, the end of all things is at hand. In, in terms of what God has said he's going to do and reveal and bring about redemption to this world, this is, the, this is it. And so the question then is, how, how then should we live? I, I read a story this last week about one of the astronauts who was sent to the moon. And in a, in a news conference, he, he was asked... When, when you land on the moon, how will you get off the moon? This is a couple decades ago, and the astronaut explained, well, we'll, well, we fire the rockets, and then we take off in our little module. And then he was asked, but what happens if it doesn't fire? He said, well, then we're stuck. How long will your life support system last? Six hours. And so the reporter then asked, well, can I ask what you will do for the last six hours? Sure, he said, I'll be working on the engine. <laughs> Mar Martin Luther was once asked what he would do if he knew the world was going to end tomorrow. And he replied, I would probably go plant a tree. And, and what he meant by, by giving that answer is that I, I hope I will continue to be faithful to be doing what I should have been doing every day. Growing and nourishing and planting and protecting and working in God's field, in God's garden. That's what I think Peter describes here for Christians. It says, the end of all things is at hand. If that's true, how are you going to live? Are you going to live, just live it up in sensuality and lawless idolatry like the world? No, Christians are going to be living faithful lives that are self-controlled and sober-minded, acting with calmness and wisdom, being prepared and alert and prayerful, being spiritually minded towards God. That's how we live in light of the end of the world. And then having our, our spiritual priorities right, then we should be faithful, he says, in our horizontal relationships. Verse, verse 8, he says, above all, above everything else, in light of this eternity, Christians should be loving one another earnestly, above everything else. Loving one another earnestly, extensively, continuously. And, and you're to do this even when it's hard. Even when your fellow Christians sin against you, disappoint you, offend you, neglect you. Because of the time, it's not worth it to let that stop your love. Instead, your love should be seeking to cover over those sins. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. So love is, is not something that you do just when it's easy. It's something that you do because it's, it's the only thing worth doing in the time. 
verse 9 is actually not a new sentence in the Greek. Um, it's actually more accurately transla translated, being hospitable to one another without grumbling. In other words, it's a continued application of love. You could say, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. Love, you could say, becomes practical when it becomes hospitable to one another without grumbling. Hospitality was an important part of the early church. Um, the early Christians, the early churches didn't have buildings to meet in. They had to meet in homes. Often Christians were persecuted. They were rejected by their families. They were impoverished because of their faith and they needed the help and provision of other believers. When, when Christians traveled to other places, especially traveling evangelists and missionaries and messengers of the churches, they regularly depended on hospitality from fellow believers, much as Jesus did throughout his ministry. And so Peter says, showing hospitality without grumbling. And what that tells you is that sometimes hospitality was hard. Sometimes your fellow Christians have personality flaws. Sometimes hospitality was costly and inconvenient, both financially and personally. It sometimes cut into your private time and household plans and household goals you had, and yet Peter tells believers to fight against that selfishness, to be willing to be generous with your home, your life, your money, your time. And, and then he says and reminds us that you've been receivers in order to be givers. Verse 10, he, he says, as each of you has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You have all received grace from God in multiple ways, in so many different ways. You've received grace. And God does not want that grace to you to be in vain. He wants it to be used to serve and bless others. And you'll notice here he, he mentions two particular types of gifts. Verse 11, you could say speaking gifts and serving gifts. And we need both. And since he's just talked about hospitality, what he may be thinking of is small group meetings of the church in homes or evangelistic meetings in homes where some people were in the homes providing the, the speaking, speaking the oracles of God, and some were providing the service needed to make it possible. And so you could say hospitality is like the hinge of, of these verses where it's the context for all kinds of spiritual gifts being displayed, evangelism and teaching and encouraging and serving and giving. This was the, the context in which these things were being done. What we're actually focusing on this morning, and I've, I've held it back until now, is the importance of hospitality for the Christian life. You could say the New Testament hospitality command. Hospitality was a specific cultural value in the ancient world for numerous reasons, but it was a particular value for Christianity. It was, you could say, part of the power and effectiveness of the early church, and it's a command in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Hospitality is a reflection and demonstration of the gospel. It reflects the heart of God. Romans 15 verse 7 says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. John, John Piper said, grace is the hospitality of God. Grace is the hospitality of God to welcome sinners, not because of their goodness, but because of his glory. God, God didn't welcome us in because he was lonely. He did it because he had a heart that was overflowing in generosity. Um, throughout the Bible, our God 
is described as a stranger lover. Um, the word hospitality in, in Greek is a compound word. It's the word philoxenos. And it, and it generally means hospitality, having people into your home. But when you take apart the, the parts of the word, philo and xenos, philo means love, and xenos is related to the word for stranger. And so very woodenly, it's love of strangers. Uh, in the Old Testament, God reminded his people repeatedly that they were strangers in the land of Egypt and wanderers in the wilderness when he redeemed them and brought them into his family. In Leviticus 19, he says, you shall treat the, the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. And, and what he means is, I showed you love as a stranger and brought you into my family, and now that is to be reflected in your life. Exodus 23 says, you shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. And so in the New Testament, similarly, the work of Jesus is described as bringing strangers near. Ephesians 2.13, Paul says, In Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Instead, you're what? You're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The, the Bible pictures God's redemption as a great banquet and feast, which God has prepared for us and invited us in. Psalm, Psalm 23, verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my, my head with oil, meaning you, you, you've made me presentable in your house. My cup overflows. You've blessed me. And, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus describes heaven as a reclining at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the saints. So this is the, the hospitality and grace that God has shown to you as a Christian. And so he says it's part of your calling now to demonstrate and reflect that to others. Turn over with me to, to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 13. says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Most, most of you know that Romans 12 is the application turning point of the book of Romans where Paul begins to apply the theology of grace that he'd been explaining for 11 chapters. And in chapter 12, verse 1, he begins saying, in, in response to all of these mercies that God has shown to you, you as God's people are called to live to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice together with all of God's people. And then he goes on and talks about how Christians are to live in humility and community, knowing that you've been united together in a body, and so you must use your gifts in service to one another. And because of this body life and union in Christ, Paul says, verse 9, therefore let love be genuine, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And so what, what we see is that hospitality then is a central practical demonstration of love and sharing with the saints. Um, I think the, the translation seek to show hospitality is a bad translation um, because 
I don't know about you, but if you hear like seek to show hospitality, it's like, you know, try. But if you, you know, if it doesn't work, don't worry too much. Um, the verb there is actually much stronger than that. And some other translations, I think, get it better. It really means to pursue with effort, to strive towards. That's what they were trying to get at with seek to show. It's, it's, but it's, the idea is strive. One, one commentator says classical Greek writers use this word in the context of hunting, like to describe the attitude of a hound chasing a fox through the forest. So Paul does not mean perhaps you should be open to the possibility of being hospitable. Don't refuse if you're asked. Hospitality is not passive. He wants us to go after it, chase it down, and not stop until you've wrestled it to the ground. Now, I don't recommend that after the service is over this morning. But that's the, the idea when he says, pursue hospitality. Before Paul was a Christian, he described himself as pursuing Christians to death, to put them to death. And it's actually the same word in Acts that he uses here for pursue. Now, we don't want to pursue hospitality until people kill themselves. But that's the zeal that he describes here. So one, one writer says, if you need me, call me is not the spirit of Christians. The, the ancient Christian father Chrysostom says, he does not say doing it, but given to it, so as to instruct us not to wait for those that shall ask it and see when they will come to us, but to run to them and be given to finding them. The Christian life is not about waiting around for other people to minister to you or waiting for people to ask you. It is seeking out opportunities for ministry. It's not about, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. A loving person is not a needy person who's hungry for the love of others. That's just selfishness. A loving person responds to the love of God that's been shed abroad in their hearts by overflowing with love for those around you. It's so easy to come to things. It's so easy for us to just not even be aware how obsessed we are with, with ourselves looking for ourselves, looking to be ministered to you. We, we come to church and, and you sit down and you, you're looking to be ministered to. And, and mature Christians know that you need to come and you need to receive the gifts of grace, but you also know that you are to give grace to others. And so you come to church, not just to receive, but to give and to serve. And so when, when the service is over, your mindset should immediately be, I've just received grace from God so that I can use it, not for myself, but, but serve others. So the service ends and you're looking for opportunities to serve, which means opportunities to encourage. You're looking around you and saying, who, who's here who needs a word? Who's, who's a stranger here that needs to be made to feel welcome? Turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> Hebrews 13 verse 1 and 2 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Similar to, to Romans 12, Hebrews 13 begins the practical application section of the book of Hebrews. And, and you notice immediately when he switches to practical application, the immediate emphasis again is on what? Love and hospitality. 
and, and the connection between love and hospitality. Hospitality is always found in the context of, of love for the, the brethren. Let brotherly love continue. You know, the, the three images the New Testament most uses for the church are, are a building, a body, and a family. The, the church is a building intricately fit together. It's a body intimately growing together and a family loving and caring for one another. And I think it's really easy in our busy, individualized, isolated lives to lose this sense of the church as a family. Um, if you were a, an early Christian, the church as a family was very real to you. Becoming a Christian was often costly. I think this is the case for people around the world today. Becoming a Christian is costly. It often leads to the rejection of family members and friends. And so the church in the ancient world became your real and eternal family, in some ways better than your earthly family. And so Christians are urged again and again to continue to show brotherly love. Uh, 1 Thessalonians tells them to do it more and more. The, the terms brother, sister, uh, brethren occur 250 times in the New Testament. Christ left us with a command that he says that we should love one another as he has loved us and brought us into his family by laying down his own life. So what does that continuing brotherly love look like? Well, the first thing Hebrews says here in verse 2 is, do not neglect to show hospitality. And, and the phrase there that's, that's put in here, hospitality to strangers, is really just the same one word that we've seen in 1 Peter 4 and Romans 12. It's just the one word, philoxenos, the same root as the other passages, hospitality. Now, the translators put hospitality to strangers here because you notice that he, he says, Hebrews says here, the hospitality to others can actually lead to blessing for yourself. So some people who've shown hospitality have entertained angels unawares. And what it seems to be referencing is stories like in the Old Testament where Abraham showed eager hospitality to the Lord and two angels in Genesis 18, or when Lot received those two angels and protected them in Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, or when Gideon showed hospitality to the angel of the Lord in, in uh, Judges 6. When you think about it, Jesus' ministry depended on people showing him hospitality. As Jesus traveled around ministering, he relied on being received into people's homes who let him stay and use their house as a base for ministry in the towns that he went to. And, you know, this is kind of why Jesus later told them, you know, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The, these people who received Jesus into their homes and let him use their house as a base for ministry unwittingly became hosts. Before they even knew it, they became hosts to the Son of God. And their lives were forever changed because of it. And you can think about similar stories like an, of Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament who were received into homes and these prophets from God became people who brought incredible blessing to those homes. So I, I don't think Hebrews really means that we're to be on the lookout for angels. Um, what it means is that sometimes hospitality can bring, bring a tremendous blessing from God into your home into your life. God can meet with you and bless you in hospitality. Hospitality can bring a message and ministry from God into your home. There's a blessing in, in your life, in your marriage, a blessing to your children that comes from hospitality. I, I don't think I can calculate, I can begin to calculate the impact that hospitality has had on my children the number of people who've been in our house and over a meal, we've heard their testimony, we've heard of stories of God's grace in their life, and my, my children have seen that as normal and been enriched by it. 
And so we're seeking to serve others, but we're being blessed in the process. So I hope you're beginning to get a picture of the biblical place for hospitality in the Christian life. There's so many other places you can look to see this portrayed. One of the specific qualifications of elders in both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 is that elders must be hospitable. That's not just because it's a special thing for elders. It's that the elders needed to be examples of normal Christianity so that others could follow in their steps. Hospitality is not just an expectation for the leaders. In 1 Timothy 5, Paul talks about qualifications for widows to be enrolled in the financial benevolence ministry of the church. And what Peter, what Paul says is that for the widows to be enrolled in the benevolence ministry of the church, they must have a reputation for good works, having brought up children, having shown hospitality, having washed the feet of the saints, cared for the afflicted, devoting themselves to every good work. They're not just to be leeches on everybody else. The widows who are being cared for by the church are not exempt from being servants to the church which is pretty amazing. Acts 2.42 describes the early church as being devoted to the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. And it says, awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, which is what? Hospitality. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this community life was part of the power and impact of the early church. It was central to how the church displayed love for one another. Now, we live in a very different culture and world than the early church. We have different safety nets for needy people in our society. We don't often have traveling evangelists or believers who need a place to stay. We have easy to, to access hotels that are very different than the ancient world. At least for now, Christians in our society don't face the same kind of persecution and family rejection necessarily that they did in the early church. So is hospitality less important for Christians today? because the cultural pressures are different. I would say the cultural pressures for are maybe different, but those cultural pressures are just as much needed and answered by hospitality. We live in a very lonely world, right? We live in a very isolated world, a very segmented and busy world that is intent on driving people apart. So, we just as much need hospitality that breaks down the barriers and breaks the mold. What is hospitality? I, I hope you, you know from the verses we've looked at, this isn't just being a good entertainer. This is not entertaining guests with your, a pristine home and a perfect meal. It's not about showing off. It's about serving, ministering, loving. It's an attitude of the heart as well as a command in action. It's not just letting people into your home to put on a show. Hospitality is something you are to do. Hospitable is something you are to be. It's a grace and character quality that opens up your life to others, is interested in others, and pursues bringing them in. Now, obviously, I'm preaching on this for a reason. Uh, I'm preaching on this because I think this is something our church needs to hear. Hospitality has always been a value in our church, but I think it's one that we've gotten away from. In the busyness of life, in the multiplication of children, in the pressures of life, 
I, I even think maybe partly because of COVID, people have gotten out of the habit. And it's very, very easy to be friendly at church, but selfish with the rest of our time and lives. And so friendliness doesn't go anywhere. I was talking to, to one family in the church uh, this last week who regularly does hospitality for themselves, but who said in the 10 years they have been at the church, they can count the times they've been invited somewhere else on one hand. 10 years. Now, part of it's because they're doing hospitality all the time, and probably maybe people think, well, they're having people over, we can't invite them over. They're doing it and they're demonstrating it and they're benefiting from it themselves, but they're worrying about the lack of it in the church. Now, is that putting a guilt trip on you? Maybe I am doing that a little bit this morning. Um, what do you do when you're guilty? You go to God for grace. You find your hope in him and you repent. Um, how are you going to get to know people without hospitality? It's not going to happen. How are you personally going to grow in your gifts and skills for service without hospitality? People want to grow. They want to know how they can grow as a Christian. They want to learn to use their gifts for the Lord. Growth happens and gifts are used by doing and the place it often starts is not through some program out there that's safe, but through the use of your home and opening up your life. In the early church, evangelism started in the home by inviting people in. Ministry started in the home. Friendship started in the home. Strategy for ministry started in the home. One writer says, how can I draw the most people into a deep experience of God's grace and hospitality through the use of my home? Who might need reinforcement in the battle against loneliness? Who are the people who can be brought together in my home most strategically for the kingdom? What two or three people's complementary abilities might explode in a new ministry if they had two hours to brainstorm over dinner in my house? How would your children be affected if you invited your, their Sunday school teachers or youth leaders over for a meal? Your, Sunday, your, teachers, your kids have a Sunday school teacher for an entire year. What an opportunity to invite them into your home, to thank them, and for your children to see that their Sunday school teachers are, are real people. <laughs> how, how would singles or widows or students' lives be changed if you invited them in for hospitality? How would strangers become friends and messengers from God come into your life if you showed them hospitality? So what should you do? Uh, let me end this morning with, with several practical steps. And number one, bluntly, uh, repent. Um, I say that because this is a spiritual battle and we are constantly being fighting the battle of self-absorption, selfishness, um, having an ingrown heart, a fearful heart, a selfish and self-protective heart. But we've received amazing grace from God, right? We are called to become stewards of that grace to others and servants of grace. And so we, we daily need repentance. And there are things in our lives that are keeping us from exercising our gifts. Some of you, some of us know what they are and we're making excuses for them and we're not repenting of them. And there are things that, that keep us from being these conduits of God's grace and they need repentance. So we need to begin with repentance. Secondly, we need to make specific plans, specific plans. 
specific goals. We, we're going to show hospitality by obeying what God has commanded and what he has shown to us in specific ways, by, by having hospitality, which he commands twice a month, three times a month. Is that possible? We're going to set aside specific times for hospitality. For most people, uh, I would say the easiest time is probably on Sundays. And, and making these specific steps is sometimes the hardest step because it's easy to think that I know I need to do this sometime in the future. It's another thing to be purposeful to set aside the time and make the goals to do it. And it's easy to think, well, I, I need me time. I, I need to rest. I'm so busy. Well, maybe you're spiritually atrophied. And you need to build yourself back up to health. And when you build yourself back up to health, your body feels better when you do it. And you're like, why didn't I do this before? And so we need to plan it, schedule it, and do it. Number three, make a list of people you need to have over. Not just your close friends. Sometimes there's places for having close friends over. But people you need to get to know. People you feel awkward around, that you need to overcome the awkwardness. People that might need your encouragement and be blessed by, having, by you having them over. Uh, neighbors, including in this neighbors that you need to reach out to, that maybe you've, you've never had into your home, and so you've never had the opportunity to minister to ministry that comes from opening your home to neighbors. Uh, number four, be simple, but be generous. And there's all kinds of things. Don't, don't make this bigger than it needs to be so that you can talk yourself out of it. Um, make a list of very simple, inexpensive, or quick meals. Um, have paper plates and cups on hand so that it's even easier. Uh, if for those of you who've come to, to our house know that we are always going to have chili on Sundays. Um, because my wife can do it without thinking, throw it in the crock pot and throw it in the rice cooker and it'll be ready when we get home. And so we always have chili on Sundays and yet people love it. Um, and so it's simple. And, and keep it simple, but realize it's an opportunity also to be generous. We, we, we shouldn't be letting pride or selfishness get in the way. Um, you know, so, some of you are maybe thinking, I, I don't have, like if you're a single person, you might be thinking, well, you know, I don't have space for hospitality. Well, invite over some other singles, invite over some young, some young people. When, when my wife and I were young marrieds, uh, we sometimes were bold enough to call up older people in the church and say, hey, can we bring pizza over to your house tonight? It's like reverse hospitality. <laughs> we're inviting ourselves over, but we'll bring the food. Uh, number five, brainstorm plans for conversation and activity. Brainstorm a list of questions you can ask for conversation. Um, I even know people who have conversation starter jars, and they can pull out the conversation starters and ask each other questions. Uh, it's very easy when have, having new people over to ask, them sto ask their story, ask how they met, um, ask how they became Christians. On a Sunday, very easily to talk about the sermon, ask the kids about Sunday school, have plans for things you can do, pray together, sing together, go for a walk after the meal. Number six, persevere through awkwardness and roll with the punches. Um, things will happen when you have hospitality. Uh, twice, two different occasions, two different houses, in the middle of Sunday hospitality, we've had an overflowing toilet or a burst pipe in the rooms immediately above the dining room start flooding through the ceiling in the middle of the meal. Two different times, two different houses. And 
had to have the grace to turn the water off and continue enjoying our time of fellowship together and laugh about it. Um, hold things lightly. Don't be worried too much about spills. Be gracious. You've been shown grace from God. Number seven, make it a habit and regular part of your life. It will become easier as you go. And number eight, pray for God to give you joy and generosity and blessing from faithfulness in hospitality. There's probably a lot more we could say, um, but I think God has given us not only a beautiful command but a beautiful promise of the ways that he has been the, the best host we have ever had. He's the host that has not only brought us in as a guest, but as a family member. And he now asks us to be demonstrators of that grace to others and promises that when we do so, we will receive blessing from our God. Um, we have gracious, we've been graciously given, we need to graciously give. Um, God loves cheerful givers, and he promises to make all grace abound uh, for those who are, are faithful to him. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we, we pray for the work of your spirit to be stirring among us um, a, a love, uh, a love for the lost, especially a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we would display that love for, for real in our lives. Um, we thank you for the gospel that you are a gracious God. While we were still enemies, you sent your son to die for sins, to provide a way for us to be brought back to you. you you've called us as strangers and made us together one in Christ so we are no longer strangers and foreigners to you and to grace. We are fellow citizens with the saints and members of your household. And so, Father, we pray that that reality would become real in our church, that we would so demonstrate that uh, to the world around us, that you would be glorified. And we pray and ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's close our time this morning with, with prayer, and then we'll have a benediction. Grace is the hospitality of God. Hospitality is central to fellowship. Our being with each other, our gathering together, cannot, should not be isolated to Sunday services alone. Brothers and sisters, let us love one another. We can't do that or we can't do it well without pursuing being with one another. Please rise for the benediction. From Romans chapter 15, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.